Hi there, I'm Logan Medish, and this is High Caliber History. The Smith & Wesson is one of the oldest gun makers in the United States, but exactly how old it is depends on who you ask. According to Smith & Wesson's website and official story, the company began in 1852 when Horace Smith and D.B. Wesson decided to form a partnership to manufacture a firearm that can fire a fully self-contained cartridge. Now, if you only look on the surface, then you're led to believe that the company as we know it today began in 1852. Case closed. Here's how that company's beginning took shape. In 1852, Horace Smith moved to Worcester, Massachusetts to work for the tool company Allen, Brown, and Luther. During this time, he met D.B. Wesson as he was working on designs for what would become the wave of the future in gun design, repeating firearms. He didn't know it, but it would be the most important meeting of both men's lives. That same year, Smith and Wesson formed what would be the first of two eventual partnerships. They began producing the volcanic line of repeating rifles and pistols as the Smith and Wesson Company. These guns were among the first functional repeaters, and they fired a primitive type of ammunition called the rocket ball. Like so many small 19th century arms makers, the company soon succumbed to financial issues in late 1854. Smith & Wesson's first partnership was dissolved early the following year, but the company itself didn't actually go anywhere. It had a new owner by the name of Oliver Winchester, who reorganized the company and renamed it Volcanic Repeating Arms. That didn't change the fact that the volcanic guns and ammunition were unreliable, underpowered, and really unpopular. Now, Oliver Winchester would eventually rework the volcanic and create the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and go on to great success. But what of Smith and what of Wesson? Of course, there's more to the story, and it's far more complicated than Smith and Wesson's official history on the website lets on. So much so that they don't even mention this next pivotal event. Smith & Wesson officially began Smith & Wesson, make the distinction there of Smith & Wesson the men and Smith & Wesson the company, officially began as we know it today on November 17th, 1856. That we know this is no small miracle in and of itself. When the city of Springfield prepared to raise the old Smith & Wesson factory in 1971, they first sold it to Mr. Roy Jenks, the company historian, for one dollar. Before demolition, they gave him one week to rummage around and take anything he thought was valuable. This included the original chestnut paneling in D.B. Wesson's office, which Jenks installed in his own home office, as well as a treasure trove of old factory documents including the records of the company's actual founding in 1856. The company records in possession of Mr. Jinks revealed not only when the company began, but also what it cost to get Smith & Wesson up and running. The two men pooled their money together. Mr. Smith contributed $1,646.68, and Mr. Wesson contributed $2,003.63. They paid Rollin White $497 as a licensing fee for the use of his patents on the board through cylinder, with an additional royalty of 25 cents per gun. And so all told, it cost $4,147.31 to start a company that would go on to become a household name in the firearms business. Adjusted for inflation, that amounts to about $133,000. The first home of Smith & Wesson was a small shop at 5 Market Street in Springfield. At the time, they were one of four gun companies in the city, and they were by far the smallest. The demand for the company's new revolver and its cartridges would soon outgrow the capabilities of the 25-man shop, forcing Smith & Wesson to relocate to a new factory on Stockbridge Street in 1859. The new factory was completed in 1860, and the move was well-timed, as the demand for arms would skyrocket with the beginning of the Civil War. You don't have to be a brilliant economist to understand the correlation between an increase in firearms production and a wartime economy. So let's take a look at how this all played out for Smith & Wesson during the Civil War, 
and the impact that it had on both their arms and their ammunition production. The company's first really successful firearm was a seven-shot revolver that fired 22 short rimfire cartridges. With bullets weighing a mere 29 grains on the heavy end, it was, and still is, a fairly anemic round, at best. Nonetheless, plenty of Civil War soldiers carried the gun as a privately purchased sidearm for one big reason, convenience. What the rounds lacked in power, they made up for in quick and easy reloading when compared to their counterparts as cap and ball revolvers. Having a 36 caliber Colt 51 Navy is better in terms of stopping power, but it's just a brick if you've fired all the rounds and you don't have time to stop and reload it. That's why the Smith & Wesson Model 1 revolver sold like gangbusters. Between 1857, which was the company's first full year of production, and the end of the Civil War in 1865, they produced 166,677 revolvers, 86,823 of them being their Model 1. That breaks down to 18,519 revolvers a year, or 50 revolvers per day if they were operating all 365 days in a year. Even more impressive than that is the number of ammunition that they produced for those same guns. In that period of time, they churned out a whopping 43,732,260 self-contained metallic cartridges. That's 4.8 million rounds per year, or 13,312 a day, 365 days a year. Breaking it down further, that's 27.7 rounds per minute for an entire eight-hour shift. That initial startup cost paid off handsomely. By October 1865, just shy of nine years later, both Horace and DB cleared $163,000 as personal income. They were the only two residents in Springfield, Massachusetts with six-figure incomes. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $2.7 million today. Of course, wartime production numbers don't last forever. When hostilities between North and South came to an end in April 1865, there was now considerably less need for arms of all kinds, and the Smith & Wesson Model 1 was of no exception. As a result, demand for the revolvers dropped off dramatically in the following years. The company went from 50 guns a day to 10 to 15 guns per month. Think about that for a second. A good month was now just 15 guns. They went from 50 a day during the wartime to less than one gun per day during peacetime. It's almost hard to believe such a dramatic change and that the company could survive. Luckily for Smith & Wesson though, there's always another military enemy and more hostilities on the horizon. The company soldiered on through the 1870s, and their Model 3 top break revolver competed directly with the Colt Single Action Army, and in my personal opinion, it's actually the better of the two designs. The company then developed a swing-out cylinder revolver at the end of the 19th century, and over the first few decades of the 20th century, Smith & Wesson had really come out swinging. The years leading up to World War II saw the introduction of the iconic registered Magnum revolver and the 357 Magnum cartridge, among many other designs that are still with us today. The war years of World War II saw more expansion and a move to their current, for now, headquarters on Roosevelt Avenue in 1949. Built from poured concrete with reinforced steel supports, it was exactly what you'd expect an arms factory to look like at the end of World War II as we headed into the uncertainty of the Cold War. Showing no signs of slowing in the 21st century, the company is still going strong even in the face of multiple rebrandings. Today it's known as Smith & Wesson Brands Incorporated, and they saw a net revenue of $1.1 billion in the fiscal year 2021, the highest in the company's history. As Smith & Wesson guns still ride in the holsters of countless law enforcement officers and civilians to this day, I don't see it slowing down at all. The latest chapter of the company's story is one of the most iconic. Smith & Wesson announced on September 30th, 2021, that they would be moving their headquarters out of Springfield, Massachusetts, the place that they'd called home since the very beginning, and they'd be heading for Marysville, Tennessee in 2023. 
press release said that the move is due to the changing business climate for firearms manufacturing in Massachusetts. But they also note that the company is not leaving its roots behind. While the headquarters is moving and some of the manufacturing will be moving, equating to about 750 jobs in Tennessee, they'll still have a plant at home in Springfield where 1,000 people will still be employed. It's highly unlikely that Horace Smith or D.B. Wesson could have ever imagined the impact their partnership would have on the world. They would also have probably been surprised that the company that they created would remain in the same town for more than 150 years, only to be driven elsewhere by the changing attitudes toward guns in the state's business climate that they had actually helped to create. Even so, both founders were astute businessmen, and I'd be willing to bet that they'd have made the same choice. They saw their first partnership from 1852 fail, and there's no way they'd let what they started in November 1856 fall victim to modern day politics. Let me know in the comments what you consider to be the real founding date of Smith & Wesson, 1852 or 1856. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of High Caliber History. I hope you learned something today. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.